Okay, you guys are asking great questions. Um, keep me honest in terms of time, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I think two of these go a little bit together. Um, I think this is directed more to uh, Maha, said you had worked with JVP on combating white supremacy. Um, how and sort of, I think, what did that, what did that look like? Uh, and then also, what do you say to someone who says we must save Muslim women? Um, and then related to that, what are some of the ways that Islamophobia specifically affects Muslim women and LGBT people? So those I'm sort of putting together. And then the second two that I think are related, um, that when we are looking at violent acts that are committed by radical uh, Islamists, how do we work to prevent that without engaging in Islamophobia? Um, and that was, I think, I'm tying it to the question, again, I think, Maha, when you had talked about um, the Muslim community has not determined violent extremism to be a problem and that it was supported by research. Um, and could you spe specify studies or let us know what the research was? That's a lot to ask. Anna wants me to entertain you while she gets her thoughts together. <laughs> okay, I, I can go, I guess. Um, so, in terms of Islamophobia and Muslim women, um, I think this is where we're seeing, um, especially. Uh, one, especially when you're visibly Muslim, so a lot of Muslim women um, who wear a headscarf, um, being visibly Muslim then means you are um, more vulnerable to kind of the day-to-day -day hate crime type of attacks. Um, you're also though vulnerable to like what I would like um, to like the kind stranger on the street who wants to tell you how much you know they love you as a Muslim. Um, and you know, randomly stop you on the streets, randomly speak Arabic words to you, randomly give you a hug. Um, please don't do any of that. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you yeah, you would not stop random people on the street and give them a hug to make them feel better. Um, so don't do it to Muslims either. Like, um, but I think, in more seriousness. Um, when we're talking about, so for example, um, one of um, another person who's on our steering committee um, has done a lot of work around issues of domestic violence um, and talks a lot about the issue of because um, we're talking about CVE has kind of, and the national security framework has taken up so much of the discussion. Um, Muslim women, for example, are afraid to say go and deal with issues of domestic violence because they don't want to put their um, whoever is causing the problem at risk for further um, criminalization um, based on them just being Muslim. Um, so it becomes now an issue of people, ref Muslim women refusing to report acts of domestic violence um, because they don't, they may, what they may want um, to be a solution is not even an option because right away it becomes, well, your husband, your partner, etc., brother, father is now going to get extra scrutiny because when we think of violent Muslim men, that's it, that's a violent Muslim man. And that's it. And so Muslim women will be more hesitant um, to even report DV or seek out any sort of, um, even therapy, because as we're talking about, like the public health system has now also been taken up with the CVE, because they're like, well, I don't want to put, you know, the breadwinner, for example, of my family at risk. I don't want to put them being targeted for, um, for deportation. And then all of a sudden, me and my kids are left alone. So that's how you know these kinds of things have even more serious impact when we're talking about more vulnerable uh, members, such as uh, you know a Muslim woman. Um, for specifically for um, queer Muslims, because I think someone asked the question, I would suggest looking up um, Muslim Alliance for Sexual and Gender Diversity, um, especially after the Pulse shooting in Orlando. Um, they put out a pretty um, pretty fantastic statement that was talking about how. You know, all of a sudden, um, people were using this um, this horrific attack on um, a gay dance um, club in Orlando to like, okay, see those Muslims, they're homophobes, they hate the gays, they want to kill the gays, etc., etc. All this horrific language, um, as if in the United States we like, you know, treat 
um, queer folks perfectly, and it's like not a problem at all, and every, you know, we're like full liberation from queer people in the United States. Um, so I think, again, like amplifying um, what, and, and this is I think part of the complexity of talking about Muslims, because you're talking about Muslims a lot of times because Islam has been racialized as well. We, thought, we think about Muslim, we think about brown folks um, from, you know, the Middle East, maybe Pakistan, India, etc. But we know that's not true. The, the majority of Muslims, for example, in the United States are black um, and indigenous black folks um, in the United States. Um, the, the largest, the most populous Muslim country in the world is Indonesia, so completely far away from all those scary, quote unquote, you know, war-torn countries in the Middle East. Um, so like, I think that's also part of like the education of needing of just like, yeah, we talk, there is obviously a war on terror and fo folks targeting Muslims, but the Muslim community, there's 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, huge, huge diversity of cultures, races, languages, etc. And then obviously when we're talking about specific Muslim communities, so Muslim women are going to face different things um, than queer Muslims and then Muslim men and like all that internal stuff too because then you all have you know issues of culture and religion all intermixing and I think as much as you can it's you have to just continue to complicate the narrative okay so on the question of um, saving Muslim women this has very much been as many of you may know part of the discourse in the war on terror right so not only do we have to fight terrorism in the Muslim countries, but we also have to liberate Muslim women from the Muslim men. And there's a lot of um, stereotypes and tropes about gender and masculinity and other assumptions about what the Muslim community looks like and how we sort of, again, need to save the Muslim women, right? So when we bombed Afghanistan, it wasn't about just that there's terrorism in Afghanistan, it's because that they don't want to wear the burqa anymore and it's our job to liberate them from having to wear this sort of traditional religious garb. So this has very much been a part of the narrative. And traditionally, what it operates to do is sort of to present the Muslim women as sort of submissive, obedient, oppressed, right? And therefore, again, give license to target Muslim men. At the same time, I was at a hearing last year around um, women fighters of ISIS, and it was interesting because I think the idea there was to sort of present for the first time Muslim women as multifaceted, right? So not only can Muslim women be victims, but they can also be perpetrators. But what was the point of that discussion? The point of that discussion was to perpetuate more violence and now to justify not just violence against Muslim men, but also more violence against Muslim women and Muslim women specifically as terrorists because that's when you can inflict the sort of violence. It, and you can no, you no longer see Muslim women as sort of these innocent um, individuals, but rather they then become perpetrators, along with victims. So it's a very complicated, um, multifaceted sort of representation of Muslim women. Um, in my own experience, you know, wearing the hijab or wearing the headscarf, uh, people often ask me, you know, were you forced to do this? Do you feel like you're being oppressed? And, and all these other very interesting questions. Um, and it's, it's just been very interesting, right, to see how pervasive the narrative is around sort of the idea that Muslim women lack no agency, right? And in fact, what is also interesting to me is that in the organizing circles that I've long been a part of, it's Muslim women who have been doing the work of advocating against the policies of the war on terror. There rarely are Muslim men who show up to partake in challenging the state. So it's the very women who are thought of as being sort of oppressed and silent and incapable of standing up are the ones who are actually on the front lines and have been on the front lines of challenging these destructive policies. And my dear friend Roma has been one of those women and I've been fortunate enough to stand alongside her I mean, in like hundreds of rallies, protests, actions, teachings, you name it, we've been there. Um, in terms of the, I think there was like four questions, but in terms of the question around data, um, you know, there's a lot of data out there. I don't, I mean, you could read my dissertation if you want to fall asleep, but I can offer that um, as a subsequent uh, discussion. But in terms of <laughs> actual data that I can uh, give you right now, there is a global terrorism um, database that you can refer to and has, you know, basically a lot of, uh, well, it's a database. So it has data on acts of terrorism. And so there was a group of researchers from Georgia State who looked at a specific time frame, 2011 to 2015, determined that there had been 
89 acts that qualify or are considered terrorism, and of those, 11 were committed by Muslims. So this is not to say that Muslims never commit acts of violence or terrorism. This is to say that we are placing disproportionate emphasis on acts of violence and terrorism perpetrated by Muslims. What is the solution to those acts of violence? Well, as Rama has been saying time and time again, is to look at the context in which they occur. It's occurring in the context of drones being bombed, being dropped on multiple countries. It's occurring in the context of ongoing war, imperialism. It's occurring in the context of torture, Guantanamo Bay, FBI informants. I think you kind of get the picture, right? What we often see in the discourse around terrorism is that what's happening to Muslims is presented in sort of a vacuum, right? And whatever happens to Muslims, whatever response Muslims have is irrational, inherently irrational. So when the U.S. gets um, attacked on 9-11, it's perfectly okay to launch 16 years of wars, <laughs> of policies domestically, internally, that victimize and criminalize Muslim, an entire 1. what is it, 6 billion people. But it's not okay for Muslims to feel upset that they've been bombed and tortured. And if anyone has read this report, I think it was in 2015, by the Physicians for Social Responsibility, they estimated that 1.2 million Afghanis, Pakistanis, and Iraqis have been killed in the course of the war on terror. Just imagine the rage that there would be if that many Americans had been killed by a foreign government. But again, it's because we can only see Muslims as having irrational anger, and we can't conceptualize the context in which their anger occurs. So that is to say, again, to go back to the point that not only are Muslims not actually responsible for a large amount of terrorism that occurs, both domestically and internationally, but when it does, it's important to look at, again, the context. 